Ryan Mullins the Fox proudly presents the first edition of the Roast Game Awareness Month, October 1st through Halloween 2023. The first ever full month, not just October 20th and 20th alone, but the whole month dedicated to talking about the Roast Game Era, the Post Roast Game Era, the Easter Roast Game Era, and the Post Easter Roast Game Era, alongside with discussing theories, doing far more research, and even spawning more indirect yet previously unscheduled commentary series like the pre Easter Roast Game, the entire timeline, 1900 to 1999 and other theories and things I have not mentioned yet. Stay tuned, there will also be me rereading the original and second Roast Game Debates of 2017. So sit back, relax, don't go anywhere, and until the end of October, see you in October 1st for the first Roast Game Awareness Month commentary slash rant video. I am Brian Mullins the Fox, See you then. Hi everybody, I am Brian Mullins the Fox. Welcome to the month of October 2023, where we're done covering the topic of anything else anyway and we're moving on to something else more important let's talk about statistics because it's now the roast game awareness month although turkey isn't necessarily a traditional centerpiece meat choice for easter for both eras i will account for them as well because some families aren't always traditional in the sense where everybody complies to tradition other statistics will be in the background the main focus is of course the centerpiece meat the methodology for ham consumption during the post easter roast game era is multiply the consumption per capita by the u.s population then divide by 280 87.5 pounds and then divide that by 14 as in 14 pounds and for each year you'll have the answer the methodology for turkey consumption although uncommon but still happens during the post easter roast game era is multiply the consumption per capita by the u.s population for each year then divide by 24 pounds divide by 16 pounds the average weight of a roast turkey and then divide by 10 for the average number of people a 16 pound turkey serves like for example thanksgiving dinner hence why the american farm bureau federation accounts for the price by also accounting for the average number of people that this said turkey serves of all the four centerpiece meats ham lamb turkey and beef let's start with ham let's get into consumption statistics first for 2019, 4,274,018 of them were consumed. For Easter of that year, 2020, 4,232,335. 2021, 4,213,687. 2022, 4,231,303. And for this year, 2023, 4,223,560. As you can see, the consumption stats are gradually declining despite a slight increase for 2022. For wasted hams, the methodology is slightly different from the original one from the Easter Roast game numbers by the year, however. Only after you've done the original math, divide by 14 to account for the average weight of a roast ham. In 2019, 3,291,905 roast hams were wasted for Easter that year. 2020, 3,371,191 of them were wasted for Easter of that year. 2021, 3,296,429 roasted hams were wasted for Easter in that year. 2022, 3,222,500 of them were wasted for Easter that year. And finally, for this year, 3,295,506. I got this number by adding the four others and averaging them up. 
Overall, it's kind of like the consumption numbers, but fluctuates up and down differently. Now let's move on to lamb. The methodology of lamb consumption for the post-Easter roast game era is to divide the total lamb and mutton production stat for each year according to Statista by the average weight of lamb carcass, which is 66 pounds. In 2019, 2,257,576 roast lamb were consumed for Easter that year. In 2020, 2,090,909 roast lambs were consumed for Easter in that year. Same goes for 2021. Same number. 2022, 1,984,849 of them were consumed for Easter that year. And finally, for this year, 1,969,697 roast lambs were consumed for Easter this year. Even though I have never mentioned it in the Easter Roast game numbers by the year, because both the data for Wasted Lambs was unavailable and it wasn't really a common meat choice then either. So, for lamb waste during the post-Easter Roast game era, I will divide the lamb and mutton production stat in hundreds of millions of pounds by 600 million pounds and get the results there. In 2019, 2,483,000 3,333 were wasted for Easter that year. 2020 and 2021, 2,300,000. 2022, 2,183,333. And for this year, 2,166,666 roast lambs were wasted for Easter this year. What a bummer. Now let's get to Turkey. For consumption, the methodology is practically the same as it was in the Easter Roast game numbers by the year. For 2019, 1,367,917 were consumed for Easter that year. 2020, 1,347,175. 2021, 1,322,414. 2022, 1,267,187. And finally for 2023, 1,328,112. Let's get into turkey waste. In 2019, a mere 253 roast turkeys were wasted for Easter that year. 2020, 250 of them. 2021, 242 of them. 2022, 200 26 of them. And for finally 2023, 243. I got this number by adding the four others and averaging them up, like I did with the other stats, when it came to ham waste. And finally, let's get to beef. The methodology for this is the same here, just like ham, but instead divide by 3, which is the average weight of a beef roast, then by the average beef carcass weight, which is 750 pounds, and then by 10, as in 10 people. In 2019, 847,744 of them were consumed for Easter that year. In 2020, 850,842 of them. In 2021, 868,840 of them. 2022, 875,436 of them. And finally, for this year in 2023, 854,608 roast beefs were consumed for Easter that year. A decline that basically undercuts the past two years before it. The final thing we need to get into is roast beef waste. In 2019, 3,814,846 of them were wasted. In 2020, 3,828,790 of them were wasted. 2021, 3,909,782 of them were wasted. 2022, 3,939,459 of them. And finally, 2023, 3,845,737. 2023, or this year, is the one year that roast beef waste, when it came to Easter, is in slight decline. And that does it for my coverage of centerpiece consumption and waste so far during the post-Easter roast game era. Now let's cover contradictions in Easter dinner statistics 
works in the US for both eras. Let's not be too complicated. Let's just give some examples of the basic flaws of statistical coverage. Number one, just plainly inaccurate slash contradictory Easter dinner prices. The first example is according to the pricers Alec Pow. Yes, the same Alec Pow that apparently wrote that dog shit Christmas dinner price article I debunked last year. Remember this meme from over a year ago? Christmas pudding? Never heard of her. It reads, The average cost of the Easter dinner is around $104, and no, I cannot click that number, for it's just highlighted in a different color. For a home-cooked meal for eight people, which means an average of $13 per person. These costs are due to inflation, rising costs of meat, eggs, sweets, and many others. Alec then shows a list of all the items that he is apparently specifying. I added all the items that Alec decided to compile up and there's an obvious contradiction. Instead of $13 a person, it's actually $19.85 a person. And instead of it being around $104 in total, it is about $158.84. Number two, failed statistical data theft attempt. Statistical data theft being stealing statistics from another country and use it as your own, as if it came from your own country. Now, we're going to use the same article as I did with the previous example. Quick question, where the fuck did Alec Pau get the $104 figure from? Because if he was trying to steal British price stats and use them as his or America's own, then how in the hell did he fuck up this bad? What was he cutting off on the total price here? Here's another glance at the failed attempt and laugh at the inaccuracies some more. Now, if he fucked up so bad that he had to hide it by making up a price that I can't even find a source to back up or even a source that has the same exact figure, I can't even figure out how he fucked up this bad which is even worse and far more egregious. You successfully stole stats in the Pricer's Christmas Dinner Price article with obvious translations from pounds to dollars, which again I debunked last year, That and apparently a 13-pound turkey being closer to the average weight of a turkey in Britain instead of a 16-pound turkey in America, like the real average. But holy God's green shit! You shat the bet on this one, Alec. The examples I pointed out in 2022 when I debunked that Christmas dinner price article, again, according to the pricer or Alec Pow, were obvious, as clear as day. You get the drift. So now let's get into the commentary slash rant territory before this video ends. According to the National Retail Federation, many main course staples will be affected by rising prices this year. That was of course before Easter. While overall meat and produce prices stabilized in February versus year ago sales, reporting an average increase of 3%, certain categories continue to report large price increases including turkey plus 19%, potatoes plus 17 percent and spiral ham plus nine percent green beans plus three percent and lamb minus three percent will be less costly the takeaway inflation and rising food prices continue to plague consumers which will impact spending power this easter which it had in the past this year we may see a shift to cheaper alternatives like less expensive cuts of meat vegetables or store brands retailers and brands may need to strategically align promotions around key meals and seasonal items to win over cost conscious consumers Historical total expected Easter spending, 2019 to 2023. 2019, $18.1 billion. 2020, $21.7 billion. 2021, $21.6 billion. 2022, $20.8 billion. And for 2023 this year, $24 billion. Spending is growing across several categories and the top Easter items consumers say they are planning to purchase include candy $3.3 billion, gifts $3.8 billion, and food $7.3 billion. Consumers are also expected to spend $4 billion in clothing, $1.8 billion on flowers, and $1.7 billion on decorations along with $1.1 billion on greeting cards. The most popular Easter Sunday activities this year include 
Cooking a holiday meal, 56%. Visiting family and friends, 50%. Going to church, 43%. Or planning an Easter egg hunt, 34%. As in previous years, most consumers, 54%, say they will buy Easter gifts from discount stores. Other shopping destinations include department stores, 42%. Online, 33%. Local and small businesses, 22%. And specialty stores, 20%. Quote, we are seeing real Easter sales growth compared with pre-pandemic, and among the drivers are consumers who are planning to purchase more Easter clothing and gifts. Unquote. Prosper Executive Vice President of Strategy Phil Rist said, quote, Additionally, consumers ages 35 to 44 will bump up their spending more than any other group. Historical average Easter spending, 2019, $151.25. 2020, $175.85. 2021, $179.70. 2022, $169.70. 79 cents. And finally, 2023, $192.01. Those celebrating say they are inspired to shop for Easter related items because of tradition, 63%. It's a social activity with family or friends, 31%. Sales or promotions, 29%. Store displays or decorations, 23%. Or exclusive or seasonal products, 20%. About half. 54% of those not celebrating the holiday still plan to take advantage of Easter-related bargains. They anticipate spending $23.41 per person and are primarily looking to purchase candy and food. As the leading authority and voice for the retail industry, NRF provides data on consumer behavior and spending for key periods such as holidays throughout the year. The survey of 8,499 U.S. adult consumers was conducted March 1st through 7th and has a margin of error of plus or minus 1.1 percentage points. Of course, we take surveys generally with a grain of salt, but even then I don't blame the National Retail Federation. More and more people just want to take advantage of those Easter-related bargains and not mind too much about anything else Easter-related like the vast majority of people do. So before I go off on a short rant and end the video, I will shortly recap it. What we have learned today is, one, overall, no matter how it goes, the consumption and waste stats of all these four centerpiece meats ham, lamb, turkey, and beef, decline and or slightly increase from year to year. 2. Even with Alec Pau's complete fuck-up at statistical data theft, he doesn't back up the $104 figure in any part of the said article. Even if he did, the total price is contradictory to the figure itself anyway. Number 3. We went over a survey on statistical figures according to the National Retail Federation. Number 4. Never take surveys either 100% as fact, nor should should you take it with too big a grain of salt? And finally, number five, that's all I have to go over in this video. To anyone who has to desperately steal statistics from another country as if it came from your own, how could you fuck up something so simple to do? If you're going to provide a statistical figure, which does concern mathematics, and citing your sources without either citing your sources or showing us the fucking methodology that you got the figure from, then it's either hard to believe or impossible to believe that anyone like Alec Pau has a say on what stats someone just like him fails to provide without contradicting himself. Like honestly, are people really that fucking thick that they can't read with their two eyes like I can? Are they really that fucking thick? Yes, some people are really that thick fucking retarded. But most people aren't. I'm not, because I do research and all this shit ahead of time. So, with that being said, I have been your host, Brian Mullins the Fox, signing out. See you in the next commentary rant edition of the Roast Game Awareness Month. Bye. Hello, everybody. I am Brian Mullins the Fox. Welcome to the second commentary slash rant edition of the Roast Game Awareness Month, which is part of the first edition of the Roast Game Awareness Month. This commentary slash rant video will be completely different from the previous one. 
which was the first. I will be explaining my side of how the debate.org shitstorm saga went down, how it affected me, what I was pretty much doing at the time, and how I became who I am today. Let's go all the way back to October 16th, 2017. I moved in with my dad to Columbus, Ohio. A day later, in the evening hours of October 17th, 2017, I attempted to start the first official roast game debate with Slim Shady. He didn't respond, much less accept the debate request. Neither did Power Pikachu 21 or even M. Harmon. That was until Yana Girl 136 caught my attention and ire when I was previously involved in two other debates with her. The first concerning the topic of whether or not being offended that a woman wears leggings in public makes you sexist, and the other one concerning sports bras apparently being considered sexist, even though it's not. Finally, I struck gold on October 20th, 2017, when Yana Girl 136 accepted my debate request to debate about the roast game, the first of its topic and kind. The reason why there are some obvious errors in some of my sentences, it's because of autocorrect sometimes. My dad's old Kindle Fire's autocorrect was a pain in the ass to fight with every time I typed on that damn thing. I'm not going to be reading the debate in this video, I am saying that and reading the second roast game debate for October 20th, marking the 6th anniversary and six years since I officially delved into the topic in general, much less introduced it to the general public. I won by seven points because she basically just gave up and forfeited the debate. All the while, me and Yana had our first major back and forth that turned into a dumpster fire in the comment section of the first roast game debate. Then, inevitably, more people got involved. And at the end of the day, nothing too exciting or dramatic was going on. Just some crazy bitch having her little hissy fit. The initial October and November forum threads following the first roast game poll that closed on November 1st, 2017 kind of went nowhere. At around that time, my mood was generally celebratory in the wake of the first signs of the actual progress of the conversation surrounding the topic of the roast game at all. Nothing else was too eventful until the second debate occurred, other than some fake and illegitimate challenges to me by people like Crazy 456 Rhino and Frankfurt of 50 instantly, of which there were only few I rejected. The second debate happened on November 29th, 2017, and didn't go into voting period until around December 7th of that year. Of course, the first example of vote bombing on this much of a scale occurred, but was then removed by White Flame for not being a reason to vote. Meaning that when Supa Duds voted for me, he then realized how bad this looked for his side of the topic, which he immediately developed animosity towards, and outs himself as a troll later on. I ran an opinion survey sometime after the second debate, asking the following question, Is killing your entire family perfectly justified because of the roast game? At the end of the day, 67% of respondents then said yes, while 33% said no. The comment section of that second debate was filled to the brim with some raging trolls, including the forever coping Dark Prince, just rambling on about nonsense, and a bunch of other spurgs spurging out. And then it became a shit fest later on, and so did the comment section of the first debate as the Debate.org shitstorm saga continued throughout the months. Throughout the rest of 2017, starting from mid-December onward until sometime in January 2018, the activity of not just the debate section of Debate.org, but also the forum section, poll section, and even opinion survey section were also inactive for the same said period of time. All the while, behind the Kindle Fire screen, I was typically having hot pockets and a burrito for a meal, alongside with snacks, drinking Gatorade, maybe some tap water, cooking myself microwaved spaghetti and meatballs for dinner, 
sucking on mints, chewing gum, yada, yada, yada. I was also playing the Xbox One, playing video games, watching videos through the Xbox One's YouTube app. I was typically watching some reaction content, VHS openings and some VHS closings because it constantly gave me nostalgia from time to time as it usually does today, and going off on rants occasionally because I've watched something that made me passionate while feeling a bit of nostalgia in the background. I found trailer music and other pieces of music I otherwise wouldn't have. I stood up all night because me and my dad thought it was a good idea because nobody's telling us when to sleep then. For years after all this, not to be too off topic, I still did until sometime after we moved out of that cramped up apartment in Columbus, Ohio, around June 1st, 2022. Outside of debate.org on a slightly shittier debateisland.com, I started a short-lived debate with someone named William Schultz that went fucking nowhere, and it was on the same website that allowed people to vote for themselves, which is entirely not fair. Rather rigged, mind you. For Christmas of 2017, which is the first Christmas of the post-roast game era, I got a couple of new video games for the Xbox One I used to play on, which was Sonic Forces and Madden 18, alongside with some Christmas cards. I felt like that throughout the time I was on Debate.org, it felt like hell. Alright, moving it on to 2018. The new year rings and right after we came back from going to Buffalo Wild Wings and then Walmart. Before then, we had a New Year's Eve party at a relative's house for a while. Had a good time snacking, eating vegetables, cheese, other stuff, watching football games. Nothing else major happened. Fast forward forward to January 13th, 2018, when things really picked back up to normal. Back and forths began. Things got heated and eventually got out of control sometime in mid-January. I and William Schultz had a debate on debate.org that ended up in a tie regardless. Around that time of the William Schultz roast game debate, I held the last roast game related poll asking the following, should the roast game be taught in schools? To which 55% said yes and only 44% said no. That was when trolls like KWLM and Mind Dagger began to appear on forum threads, comment sections of other debates, including the troll debates that I lost that don't really count anyway, and even a few trolls that jumped onto YouTube and tried to harass me, I took none of their bullshit seriously. These retarded trolls then decide on January 28th, 2018 to start the quote-unquote anti-roast game organization. I had a debate with Mind Dagger that, just like the one with William Schultz, ended up in a tie. The vote bomb would have rigged it anyway, but didn't. And again, the debate went nowhere. On January 30th, 2018, I decided to record my first rant declaring the debate on DDO officially over. And the last roast game poll over as well. At this point, the debate was really over and trolls were fucking furiously fuming. Now we're in February 2018 in the story. Tensions got so high that I felt like I was being needlessly harassed and bullied because I didn't accept this pussy ass trolls fake debate request. Even though I previously said no to it, I had no other choice but to entertain the most dog shit troll debate, let alone the most dog shit troll that I have ever seen in my life, just to get him the fuck off my back. And it was the most egregious one of them. The last troll debate with me and KWLM, that again didn't matter and nobody even cared enough to fucking archive it, hilariously enough. KWLM's initially debunked claim was that, quote unquote, all the progress from all the debates and polls were somehow faked, and that people really took the piss, and the trolls weren't mad at all. Oh no, guys, the trolls weren't mad at all. It's that fucking crybaby liar Brian that's supposedly mad. Oh, never mind the fact that we've been pissing and shitting ourselves for months on end about this Brian guy. But you know what? At the same time, KWLM claimed that just by refusing to understand it, no matter how much empirical evidence there is to it, no matter how many facts can back up and can even literally timeline-wise back it up, it somehow automatically makes the roast game not a fact. Thinking that he's the arbiter of truth, thinking that he's the arbiter of fact, KWLM has then made by far the dumbest and obviously false claim I have ever heard during the entirety of this drama saga. 
Around Valentine's Day 2018, I started my last forum called The Roast Game Effect, Valentine's Day Edition. After that, however, when I thought the trolling was dying down and not returning to rage back on, it came back up to reach its highest and final peak. Yet, sometime before I got IP banned from Debate.org, a website that no longer exists, KWLM and many others were annoying the hell out of me. Even in my DDO messages, Airmax took such serious offense at slurs, supposedly, that her absolutely nobody involved in the saga. Airmax, after banning me permanently under my Cherry Palm account because I temporarily closed the other one, lied about the reason why. I got permanently IP banned from DDO and barred from coming back to my other one on February 21st, 2018. And it was at that moment I just fucking fell off for the first time in life mentally. And ever since then, at that time, I was mentally in tatters. My one true identity on the internet, my one existence on DDO, was banished because the trolls and assholes plagued the site then, and this is the prime moment when DDO fully went to shit. This is why we don't debate anymore. I recovered throughout the rest of late February 2018, and I said goodbye to my old channel on the same day I launched Brian Mullins the Fox, or currently known as Brian Mullins the Fox main channel, open and close parentheses, on February 27th, 2018. And ever since then, I have never been the same. Before the shutdown of the website, it kept blocking me from signing into my older account that went under the username Brian Mullins No Christmas 2. Even though before my Cherry Palm account got permed, I reopened my older one. So even though it was open until the debate.org website shut down, the trolls mass flagged my DDO account back then and got me banned. Deplatforming me was their last resort. It worked. That website went further and further to shit until things came to a head, and they announced their shutdown for June 5th, 2022. It was actually shut down at midnight or sometime around that on June 6th, 2022. I have since long before their shutdown archived both debates that became the genesis that took place back in 2017 that introduced the roast game as a topic just like George Gershwin has introduced a Paul Whiteman and his orchestra with his hit that broke the boundaries of classical music, Rhapsody in Blue. I archived both debates so I didn't have to do it before they shut down. So, with that being said, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for sticking around and hanging out with me, having fun, doing whatever, this, that, and whatnot. I am Brian Mullins the Fox, signing out. See you in the next commentary slash rant video. Hi everybody, I am Brian Mullins the Fox, providing to you, the audience, the third installment of the first edition of the Roast Game Awareness Month. This time, we'll be talking about the first theory ever discussed during this month. Here it is. What would the post-traditional Christmas dinner era be like? In either late 2026 or late 2027, families will not just suddenly stop using turkey or ham as the centerpiece of Christmas dinner, but abandon traditional Christmas dinner altogether, ending the post-roast game era and the then-to-be 126 or 127 year history of Christmas dinner in both America and Canada in the process. Families of all likes will just opt for a regular dinner on Christmas. Christmas Day, technically making it a Christmas, in quotations, dinner because it's taking place on Christmas Day, but nothing else. Nothing else makes it special at that time anymore because it would be dinner on any other day. I don't know about Christmas parties, specifically in workplaces of all kinds, at a relative's or your house, or even at a church, all before Christmas Day, which is of course December 25th, 
But this will also kill the spirit of Christmas in the most important way imaginable. Because as soon as traditional Christmas dinner eventually goes away and completely out of favor to these families, there goes the remainder of its importance in the only sense imaginable and the only part of Christmas history, despite what people have believed in the past, that wasn't a total lie, even when they lied to anyone much less themselves about its own history, let alone gaslight others about its own history. In my opinion, having a normal dinner, even on Christmas Day, isn't even a problem at that time. It's only a matter of if everyone can eat all the food that's been cooked without wasting any of it due to being too full to finish the damn plate. Traditional Christmas dinner in America, and likely Canada as well, isn't even 200 years old. By the time even recording this video, Canada is 156 years old, and America didn't start their Christmas dinner tradition as a commonplace thing until 1900. And even at that point, it was growing steadily until it suddenly stopped in 1998 when the roast game era crept in and occurred for roughly 19 years in both America and Canada. The only differences that I can care to remotely mention is that Canada is older than traditional Christmas dinner by 33 years, and America is way older than traditional Christmas dinner by 100 124 years. If we account for these two differences by combining them, traditional Christmas dinner in both countries is older than Canada is now by one year. When it continues next year, it will be just as old as traditional Christmas dinner there as long as Canada is a nation. Eventually, by either the Christmas of 2026 or 2027, when it does die there, just like it will in America, the age difference, the two would still be the exact same, still 33 years apart in age and time. Strangely enough, by the year 2000, which is technically the last year of not just the 1990s, but the second millennium, Canada was just as old as traditional Christmas dinner will be this year. And yes, I am counting the roast game era in both countries as part of its history. I wouldn't count off its history if I were you. I wouldn't gaslight other people by trying to cover it up. I wouldn't even try to cover up for the fact that something as brutal as that ever happened at all. Food waste, regardless of the reason why you do it, will never go away just because a big tradition dies off. Food waste will still be around, and at this point in the next three to five years, Thanksgiving will go from the second most wasteful holiday when it comes to food waste to the absolute number one most wasteful holiday if Easter doesn't take over in that regard. The death of traditional Christmas dinner in both of these two countries will become a burden for holidays like Easter and Thanksgiving to fulfill because Christmas dinner, in a traditional sense, then will have become so non-existent and obsolete that it makes Thanksgiving dinner and Easter dinner seem like the only real traditional ones that exist. Other than what, the 4th of July or something like that? I don't know. Especially Easter during the post-Easter roast game era, which I've covered in the first commentary rant video in the first edition of the Roast Game Awareness Month. But before I go off on a rant about what all of this will do to me, my relevance, and my channel, I will make a few things abundantly clear. Number one, I still don't know which year it will be exactly, until I see a recurring trend that makes itself clear that it's either 2026, which is 10 years after the roast game era ended, or 2027, 10 years after the post-roast game era began. Number two, during the roast game era, even when teachers surrounding children are mandatory reporters in America and Canada, the reason why they'd never notice or care is because one of the parents of that said child legally took them out of school by withdrawing them out of school legally. Because they think that some of their own children are a threat to society, much less their extreme Christian beliefs and their way of believing in Christmas. And finally, number three, I believe that Thanksgiving, much less Thanksgiving dinner and Easter and Easter dinner, will suffer in the end. So now, here is the rant. I wonder why I've managed to maintain and retain the following that I have on the internet. 
I wonder why I managed to stave off idiots and actual conspiracy theorists on the internet whose only goal is to shut down the conversation, either out of the conversation or off the internet, from their own embarrassments of their failed character assassination, let alone character assessment attempt of 2019. I wonder why I'm so passionate for a topic that at the end of the day mattered so much more than I ever knew it to. And it will matter 10 times more in the next 4 years, even after all my channels have, relevancy-wise, failed into obscurity if and when I venture into other topics other than the one I have literally been talking about for the better part of a decade for about six years. The Fursona arc template may die by then in either 2026 or 2027, if not 2028, but I'll just then use an image of an actual Corsac box as my avatar, but I'm still a furry then. I'm not leaving the furry fandom. If the furry fandom will die, I'd only be the last one to leave it. Alright? There, I've said it. I have announced, near the end of 2021, during my video talking about how the reversed content era is dead, I may leave the furry fandom in like one to two years or so. Pfft, that's bullshit. I'm not gonna leave the furry fandom. Fuck all that. But before I go and end this video, I want to make something clear and just end the video there. I know the difference between anthro and feral. And don't even get me started with that conversation, because I know there are going to be people who will make false equivocations and all that fallacious shit. I'm not going to fucking tolerate that nonsense. And, by the way, in the next commentary rant video, in this first edition of the Roast Game Awareness Month, I will go into exactly how many kids were legally withdrawn from school because of the Roast Game, for them not believing in Christmas, during the Roast Game era, and seeing if it matches the yearly Roast Game death toll, take into account all of the demographics that I've demonstrated years ago and years later. But until then, I am Brian Mullins the Fox, signing out. See you then. Hi everybody, I am your host, Brian Mullins the Fox. Welcome to another research-based commentary slash rants video and the fourth installment of the first edition of the Roast Game Awareness Month. This time, we are going to go deeper than I have ever dug so far. But the title of this video is an understatement to how much research and the number of things I concerned myself with statistically as of making this video. Like separating reasons why they withdraw their kids from schools, factoring in for other irrelevant things that I can count off like I did with child deaths in the second part to my 2019 series bashing the religious. Also, I will be accounting for demographics like race, religion, gender, and determined whether or not it matches the yearly roast game death toll in only America. Now, I would wait for some time later to do the same for Canada eventually, possibly in the next edition of the Roast Game Awareness Month next year. At the same time, I will account for yearly fluctuations, possibly just like the Roast Game death toll fluctuates only on leap years, as it has been demonstrated to in the Roast Game numbers by the year 1998 to 2016. Let's look at the statistics, shall we? Well, don't worry. Unlike what I promised beforehand, I really don't have to cut off irrelevant withdrawal statistics. All I did is use the total roast game death toll by age and took all of it into consideration. Students from the age of 5 to 17 years old. Alright, since this is going to be a long ass video, prepare yourselves for what has been the hardest part of making this video a thing. Let's figure out a methodology that factors in what's relevant to this video and the topic of the roast game, and factor out what's not relevant indirectly. This clearly isn't cherry-picking, because data and stats are hard to find, especially for middle, elementary, school, and kindergarten dropouts. We're going to do this for children slash children by law from the age of 5 years old to 17 years old, so it's not just one set statistic. It's multiplex. What is the difference between a drop and a withdrawal? A course drop happens when you drop or are dropped from.
from your class or school on or before the census dates, the official day of record. A course withdrawal or school withdrawal happens when you drop or are dropped from your class or school after the census date. Let's start with high schoolers between the age of 14 to 17 years old. Status dropouts between 14 to 17 years old from 1998 to 2016. 1998, 198,594. 1999, 259,706. 2000, 433,711. 2001, 369,107. 2002, 346,000. 2003, 323,000. 2004, 380,000. 2005, 304,000. 2006, 334,000. 2007, 341,000. 2008, 300. 309,000, 2009, 218,538, 2010, 214,110, 2011, 182,640, 2012, 150,336, 2013, 143,948, 2014, 129,844, 2015, 131,835, and for 2016, 125,345. Now to set this methodology straight, I divided each of these numbers to get the percentage of the difference between the yearly roast game death toll for this age demographic from 12 to 17, also accounting for middle schoolers after I get through high schoolers. Let's start with dividing the percentage of status dropouts who were also casualties of the roast game, or for each year for the age demographic, 135,667 of them. 1998, 68.3%. 1999, 52.3%. 2000, 31.3%. 2001, 36.8%. 2002, 39.2%. 2003, 42%. 2004, 35.7%. 2005, 44.6%. 2006, 40.6%. 2007, 39.8%. 2008, 43.9%. 2009, 62.1%. 2010, 63.4%, 2011, 74.3%, 2012, 90.3%, 2013, 94.3%, 2014, 95.7%, 2015, 97.2%, and 2016, 92.4% which makes the average percentage during the roast game era of status high school dropouts. 63.3% are casualties of the death toll during a regular 365 day year. The total roast game death toll for children by law who are high schoolers, 1,545,786 high school students. Now we're gonna count off the middle schoolers, which makes up the rest of the fucking death toll in this demographic of 12 to 17 years old. Now let's get into middle school students. We're using the estimate by percentage derived from the high school student estimate, also according to the roast game death toll, or the averages and percentages mentioned earlier. The average percentage and yearly high school death toll as mentioned previously. 896,214 of these children by law between the ages of 12 to 13 years old out of the rest of them who turned out to be high schoolers when they were withdrawn, which makes 49,790 of them middle schoolers yearly or 136 daily. Now let's get into elementary school students to fill in the gap to complete the roast game death toll. The yearly 556,396 children, 1,524 daily. Now let's get into kindergartners. 1,784,972 kindergarten age children, 99,165 of them yearly, or 272 of them daily during the roast game era for every single one of these 365 day years. Now let's account for leap years. They are practically the same daily in a leap year, but they're slightly different. Instead of a normal 365 day year for kindergartners is 99,436 instead of 99,165. Instead of it being 556,396, it's 557,923 yearly. Instead of it being 49,790 of the middle schoolers yearly, for leap years it's 49,926. And for high schoolers, instead of it being 271,929 of them yearly, it's 272,672 of them yearly. All of this 
adding up to the early roast game death toll only for the leap years, 979,957. So just like the roast game numbers by the year, accounting for both 365 day years and leap years, the yearly school withdrawals by their parents between the age of 5 to 17 years old for the years 1998, 1999, 2001, 2002, 2003, 2005, 2006, 2007, 2009, 2010, 2011, 2013, 2014, and 2015 is 977,280. For leap years, such as 2000, 2004, 2008, 2012, and 2016 is 979,957. Now let's get into the race demographics. Here are the yearly roast game related school withdrawals by race starting with whites. For 98, 99, 01, 02, 03, 05, 06, 07, 09, 2010, 2011, 2013, 2014, and 2015, it is 626,436. For leap years 2000, 2004, 2008, 2012, and 2016, it is 628,152. For blacks, who make up 29% of the roast game death toll, also make up 29% of the yearly school withdrawals because of the roast game. For non-leap years, as the year is previously stated, for 1998, 1999, 2001, 2002, 2003, 2005, 2006, 2007, 2009, 2010, 2011, 2013, 2014, and 2015 is 283,411. And for leap years 2000, 2004, 2008, 2012, and 2016, it is 284,187. For Hispanics, when it comes to non-leap years, 365 days a year, for 1998, 99, 2001, 2002, 2003, 2005, 2006, 2007, 2009, 2010, 2011, 2013, 2014, and 2015, it's 9,773. For 2000, 2004, 2008, 2012, and 2016, it is 9,800 of them a year during the roast game era. For Asian Americans, for 1998, 99, 2001, 2002, 2003, 2005, 2006, 2007, 2009, 2010, 2011, 2013, 2014, and 2015 is 16,711 a year. For leap years 2000, 2004, 2008, 2012, and 2016 is 16,712, an increase of only one more death for each leap year. And finally, for other races excluding Asian Americans, 40,949. For leap years is 41,106. Six. And that basically covers the statistical summation of this entire video. So, in conclusion, I didn't need to cut off any irrelevant school withdrawal reasons or whatever because they're very hard to find or impossible to factor out because it's pointless to do so anyway. So now, before I go off on a rant, it all adds up. The roast game still happened during this era from 1998 to 2016, but the school withdrawals, even when teachers and people who work at a school are all mandatory reporters, just like first responders and other people, parents withdrawing the students from schools doesn't make much of a difference because teachers wouldn't care afterwards because it would have been done legally and it would have been no problem anyways despite what the teachers don't know about what happened to those students anyway so now here's the rant Honestly, I can't even believe I actually got the ability and the time to do this. The point's been proven and I'm so glad I've been doing this for almost six fucking years. Imagine all that fucking time that teachers have to go through teaching other kids, never knowing what happened to them anyway. They weren't too nosy of teachers or principals or administrators. I don't think that they need to be mandatory reporters simply because parents have taken care of the job for them by withdrawing them out of school. Even though it's not mandatory for any kid to go to school, a lot of them end up being dropouts and not just high school, but middle school, elementary, and even kindergarten. Which makes it all the more suspicious why there is a lack of kindergarten, elementary, and middle school dropout statistics that actually matter more, especially when it comes to a phenomenon in the past like the roast game. Why would there not be any statistics? Is it that difficult to fucking calculate, to take into account? Is it really that difficult or is there something else going on that I'm not aware of? Is there anything that's happening that I should be aware of? Like statistical data theft or intentional data emission? And again, the citations have already been shown on screen or you can go to the links in the description box down below because I'm too lazy to cite them verbally. I am Brian Mullins the Fox signing out. See you then.
Hi everybody, I am Brian Mullins the Fox, your delightful host. This time, let's get very serious about this. I really wonder why there aren't any American kindergarten, elementary school, or middle school dropout statistics available. So I looked each up on Statista first, because Statista is typically my first go-to website for stats, data, and even some surveys that we can all take with a grain of salt. Not because Statista isn't the original source, but because nobody even double-checks anyone in case if they're lying or just wants to save face to gullible statisticians, surveyors, and even journalists who take it at face value. And here's the double standard I pointed out. It isn't because they don't fail and just go through. I understand that some of those students who failed were the ones through no fault of their own. They can't control things like the very disabilities that they are riddled with, parental abuse, or even them being too much of a threat to others so much to the point that you wouldn't necessarily blame them for instances like bullying. Some mothers are so goddamn ignorant that they don't even realize what plops right underneath them, right between their legs, until they see their child's first report card. Some fathers are so blissfully ignorant of who they even conceived until they utter the first time they said the word fuck. It's that mostly both of them can't care enough to try and see what is wrong and do something about it the right way. Some of them do and actually do something about it to the point where the kid excels. Most of them don't because they don't expect them to fail. They expect them to succeed and nothing else cuts it. Not even passing grades aren't always 94 to 100. It could be 70 to 83 or lower than 94 to 100. But never to the point in any time, let alone all my life, have I ever seen such a lack of statistics of a certain shortcoming that even children face about something that would otherwise be easily documentable to the point where Statista could have had something to explain or tried to get to know why problems like this occur. I can't even tell or look up an article that I can easily have access to is stealing statistics from another country and using them as if it came from our country. Nor do I believe that it's supposedly because not many of them fail just that much to the point where they dropped out. So I may just rule out statistical data theft in this one for the explicit reason that there is a lack of stats, let alone data that does represent America. And if you haven't watched the previous installment of the Roast Game Awareness Month, I already got through all those stats and used the Roast Game Yearly Death Toll as a reference to what school they all went to before they were withdrawn from school and slaughtered for their butt meat because the child didn't believe in Christmas or questioned the meaning of Christmas as if something so minor and petty bothered them anyway. So now here's the rant. If you were expecting another deeply researched commentary slash rants video just after the previous one I made, you're not alone in being disappointed in how far the research didn't even take me to make this one a thing. It all seemed harder to do for me than it actually was. It all seems like it was going to be so much more than just this revelatory thing for me to go ahead and show to the world, like an accomplishment, even though it actually is. But all that research that I had to do was fucking painstaking. Even during the video editing process, process. It was a pain in the ass because I didn't have time to do some retakes of me misreading one number I somehow completely glossed over because I am human and make minor mistakes like this. But I had the audio editing capabilities and skills to damn near camouflage some audio bits. Fucking hell. All that time spending hours of research when I was at the library this past Monday, it was so chaotic rearranging screenshots, deleting useless and worthless screenshots. Sometimes I fuck up at math, because when it comes to something as complex as this, it was pretty fucking hard. This may just be new ground for me to improve my math skills. I've been an atheist for seven fucking years now, and I am embarrassed at my childhood. I'm embarrassed by the way my mother raised me in a Christian home. I used to be some fat retard retarded kid with no capability to look and think outside of this dogmatic religious box. I'm ashamed at how it only took so much time, just this much, just to realize how much of a gigantic failure as a kid that I was. Holy fucking shit! Can you imagine being in that situation, living in a home built off of nothing but mistrust, paranoia, and sheer delusional slash fucking delirious and blissful ignorance of the outside world that I had then, only to come out of it, seeing it for what it is, 
when I couldn't sleep at night once in April 2021. Months after my grandmother died, that was when it finally dawned on me. But something else dawned on me long before that. It had. It finally fucking had. I lived a fucking lie before I fully knew it yet. It was at that moment, but on October 20th, 2017, when the first debate began, all the way up to now, however, all I ever have to do is seal time's fate. Well, Brian, what in fresh hell do you mean, seal time's fate? Well, you see, I not only have to continue to see what's in store for me and to create more original content in store for all of you, I have been doing this for the better part of a decade. And my only goal from now on is to make it a goddamn decade. Make it ten whole motherfucking ass years of the roast game over and over and over and over and over again without having the slightest need to bang my head into the wall like I'm somehow fucking jealous that I fucking stuck to something and something good and it not being some old generic retarded fucking shit that regular fuckers out there constantly spurg out about on the regular i promise you that the next commentary slash rant installment to the first edition of the roast game awareness month will be just a rant about looking back at all the roughly six years of me doing all this shit you know me best for today i would have done something else for october but fuck it i don't even know exactly where any of this is going to go but i'll just hope for the best because all this is so fucking worth it that this entire series is a thing where i spend the entire month of october as a more treasured one than i ever treated it as before that's what makes me shine bright and stand out from the crowd that's what makes the topic of the roast game special that's what in the tamest hell that i was bellowing outwardly about for so long but it's okay i've done my best and the only hope that i have for the next four years is to maintain the standard and make it a decade so I feel like a young man again. Even when I am leaving my 20s and heading into my 30s by 2029. If I can accomplish that even though I'm not begging for it, maybe some woman can be able to find someone like me and we together can help sire a child and bring him into this world. Or her if it's a girl. Maybe I'll never sire a kid in my life and never find a woman desperate and morally horny enough to even accidentally stumble upon someone like me. I don't know if and when I'm going to die, but let this be the many final words that leave my lips when I do go. Here are two quotes. The first one is, if it weren't for a topic like the roast game, someone like me would have died in the middle of the Tennessean winter long, long ago. And this one will really kick my ass for as long as I live for saying it. But here's the second quote. Children were never special anyway. Parents just really know how to take them out. Sorry for the excess passionate ranting. It was all worth it all along. But with all that being said, I am Brian Mullins the Fox signing out. See you in the next episode or the next commentary slash rant installment of the first edition of the Roast Game Awareness Month. See you then. Hello everybody, I am Brian Mullins the Fox, your delightful host, here to address a misconception that somehow made it into the minds of dozens of idiots. I will not give the barest light of day or attention. I don't even know where any of these mongoloids got this dog shit conspiracy theory from. What even is a fetish to them or anyone else anymore? What can the trauma whores not stretch to such an insane extent that they have to make content off of fake? drama for views. I don't know, and don't care to know because I don't have any time for any more of that fake drama shit. When did this become a commonly believed misconception? Who was the initial tinfoil hat wearing dipshit that came up with this? I don't know and I don't care either. Because people are stupid and can we not be stupid for once? Now, you could argue that I am obsessed with talking about this extremely fucked up past phenomenon known as the roast game, but it's not and has never been a writer's deeply disguised fetish. My writing skills in that now deleted Wattpad story was god awful and just demonstrated Sasha being a victim of rape that she couldn't fight back anyway because she was a dog, not a human, that could fight against it, or at least have the chance. But she ironically said something to exacerbate an already fucked up situation, which is dogs eating human flesh. Here's just this one tiny microscopic problem that I have with these people. Let me call out this complete lie. Dogs eating human meat isn't 
fucking cannibalism, you fucking retards. Never was and never will be. Sasha was only trying to fight back against what Charlie allowed to happen and what he did to her after that. Where's the sick fetish? It's supposed to be a tragic tale of trauma, actual trauma in a fictional story, not a writer's barely disguised fucking fetish. Because dogs and humans are not the same species. They may have one thing in common, they are mammals, but they're not the same species. Anyone who says otherwise should be mounted up on my wall. If I were to have written that these all dogs go to heaven dog characters were eating flesh from another dog they killed for not believing in Christmas, that would be cannibalism. The fact that they dismiss me for this is beyond insane, and really goes to show the completely oblivious retarded nature of the type of audience you would find as a part of a deeply fucked up content farmer. I'm not gonna mention his name anymore because he doesn't need any more content to farm through or use as continuance of a drama that I don't need any part of anymore. He's done silting and sweating, give him a break, but thankfully someone archived the Wattpad story and boy did I fucking cringe at it then and boy do I cringe at it now. He's busy doing what he does best in content farming for views. Drama, 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 and nothing else of any importance at all. This isn't to defend myself against something that isn't even cannibalism, let alone real. This whole story detailing Sasha's drama. Sasha, this character that isn't real, and is a fictional character voiced by Sheena Easton that I had a crush with for just about seven years until I stopped. If anyone were to make the argument that since Brian wrote this horrifically executed dog shit ass story, there's proof that the roast game is in any way a writer's barely disguised fetish, I guess I'm not the perfect candidate for the padded room. After all, now am I? If anything, I would have been the furthest away from an asylum. That's actually funny and ironic. A bunch of retarded people clearly are, not me. So now after debunking this failed abortion of a conspiracy theory, now let's have a rant. Allow me to make this a brief one, so explain this to me, the following retards. In what fucking universe does a dog eating human meat be considered cannibalism? Name that one fucking person who initially made that shit the fuck up and I will tell them right in their fat fucking faces. You don't know what the fuck cannibalism is if you think that's cannibalism. A dog eating a human knee equals cannibalism because I'm retarded. Because unlike you, I've done all the necessary homework for the past roughly six years and then some along the way. You have no goddamn clearly calculated clue about what any of this shit means to anyone, let alone me. I've done more than just believe the hearsay of a feckling fat fuck in his late 30s or anyone else and take it as absolute fact. Fuck all that. I double checked everything that I said that isn't a mistake from hell and back to verify. And I can certainly say with 100% certainty that this is not a serious gotcha in any way, shape, or form. And I don't even give the slightest fuck that nobody cares that I am making a video just like this. There isn't a mandatory period of time that I'm supposed to defend myself and respond to something of a fart to avoid calling it a statement of fact that I don't even take seriously. Like dogs eating human meat literally and unironically being considered cannibalism to a bunch of retarded mongoloids. I can't even believe that people can be this fucking stupid. That this would be a passable statement of fact to people who don't even care to actually know what a fact is, let alone do any research or read any definitions of the word cannibalism. Which is ironic as fuck because I can somehow tell the irony behind that. But other than that, I have thoroughly proven my point to those who are actually intelligent enough but not to those who already made up their minds about me baselessly. Including those random profile pic using no personality having dumbasses and a bunch of fucking losers who need to either make a case for themselves by getting themselves a fucking personality and make content that people care to watch or shut the complete fuck up and get off the internet. Otherwise, thank you all for watching. I am Brian Mullins the Fox, your delightful host, signing out. Oh, that's a fucking relief that I made this video a thing, let alone recorded this audio. See you in the next Friday to Monday Roast Game Awareness Month commentary slash rant dose of content. Bye.
Hi everybody, I am Brian Mullins the Fox, your delightful host, here to talk about something a bit philosophical in nature. Why are people just so goddamn lazy and not do any research on anything deeply, let alone Christmas dinner unlike what I do? Why is it a natural occurrence on the internet that there are so many copy-paste articles regurgitating the same debunked quote-unquote statistics or quote-unquote estimates I've debunked years prior? Because people in general, when they do no research at all are lazy, stuck up, arrogant, useless, worthless, do nothing losers. All those characteristics don't at all and never will perfectly sum me up because of the following reasons. Number one, I'm not lazy in my research. I put so much hard work in any video that I do such painstaking research on. Number two, I'm not stuck up. I just take actual criticism, not bullshit non-criticisms or troll comments that are useless with their terrible, no good, very bad, quote-unquote counsel or quote-unquote advice. I'm usually kind and honest with my audience and tell these trolls and losers to piss off. Number three, I'm not a useless researcher because research sometimes is hard for even me to do because of how useless other people who don't do their goddamn research at all actually are. Number four, I'm not a worthless content creator. It's just that YouTube has the borderline fetish of repressing smaller content creators who even try to excel on the platform. Number five, I'm not a do-nothing person. I am not too lazy a furry to be too passionate a researcher on the internet. So that's out of the way. Number six, and finally, I'm not a loser. I don't have to explain that to you because fuck you if you think that I should. I know that weekend number three won't be too eventful unlike the last one, but brace yourselves. Weekend number four will be likely by far the most eventful one for me in the first edition of the Roast Game Awareness Month as much as it is to you. Let's go off on a brief rant, shall we? Well, I have proven my point and said my piece, and the only way I can at least get something through to the masses is an off-handed brief tangent. I just don't know why people are like this, other than the reasons I've described myself not being amongst their number in this video. It baffles and staggers the hell out of me to no end how people can be this fucking lazy, stupid, and dishonest when it comes to them supposedly doing research. And just to end this brief rant, all of this is because, unlike me, fuck these people. Fuck these people to oblivion, and fuck these people forever. Don't use them as a source. Don't use them as a reliable way to do research for you. You do your own goddamn research, you lazy fuck. I'm Brian Mullins the Fox, signing out. I don't know if the next one will just be like this one or a statistical analysis of something else, roast game related, topic wise, but we'll find out soon enough. Bye. Hello everybody, I am Brian Mullins the Fox, your delightful host. Welcome to the 8th installment of the first edition of the Roast Game Awareness Month. This one will be off script this time, and will have to do with what people don't understand about statistics and how much it really makes sense that I do all this research, like I've done for the past few years. You don't just go off and go along with some random estimate with no methodology behind that. You know that I've talked about this, you know that I've mentioned this for so many years, and you know what? I make articles on Medium.com that do all the research for you, alright? If you don't need to do all that research yourself, rely on someone like me to do that for you. So you don't have to fucking sweat, lose your appetite, or lose your sanity in the process. Instead of going, oh, this article is fucking useless and nothing but fake news, and I hope the fucking author who wrote it should fucking quit writing articles and get a job outside of the internet. Yeah. If people like you were actually intelligent enough to do all that research alongside with me, you should be saying something like this. This article or this video is much more comprehensive and gives you much more information than just pointing out a fucking graph and giving you some fucking figures is what I'm trying to say. If you can't understand that, go back to school, pick up a book, and stop talking about statistics, let alone Christmas dinner statistics, anywhere on the internet, because you're not equipped to have the conversation. 
That's what I'm saying. If you don't understand the difference between this explanation and bringing in other variables to explain what's going on versus just saying, Will, Americans consume 22 million turkeys on Christmas, and then 318 million pounds of ham are consumed for Christmas every single year according to another article, right? Then just stop talking to anybody about shit like this. You shouldn't have these conversations, people. You're not worthy. Just stop. Jesus Christ. Is it really that hard to understand something so elementary, so rudimentary and commonplace? Don't just believe in some random figures with no fucking methodology, is what I've been saying for a long time. Indirectly, implying it indirectly, passive-aggressively, and even said it aggressively and directly sometimes. I'm sure because if people had the due diligence and even the intelligence to come to their own conclusion and let go of their preconceived biases, well, not just that, but completely abandon their previously held on to beliefs, then I would understand them a whole lot more and they're not really bad faith at that point. I just really don't like bad faith individuals who will never let go of their preconceived biases, who will never let go that their whole worldview is nothing more than a lie, and the fact is that they lived this lie their entire life. There are people like that who won't ever let go and they will always die on that hill no matter what you tell them. No matter how much evidence you have on your side, no matter how much proof, no matter how many causal links you can fully objectively and empirically establish establish, they will still die on the hill because they don't care about the facts. As much as they accuse you of not caring about the facts. Even though their feelings are just like, you know what, fuck you, fuck your facts, I'll go with my feelings and KYS and then just leave the internet. Because some bad faith individuals do that shit and I fucking hate when they do that shit. You know what I get really sick and fucking tired of? People who don't do their research, acting all smug, pretentious, and fucking retarded, when all they can do to save face for themselves is say nothing at all. Because if they're really that bad faith, that's all they can really do just to keep the conversation right where the fuck it is, instead of having to derail it or drive it off the fucking proverbial cliff. Because I get sick and tired of that shit. I get sick and tired of how pretentious and retarded and smug people can act and be at the same fucking time that it really drives my blood to a boil, so much to the point where I would want to block them and never have a conversation with them ever again, let alone the first time. I know it's the internet. I don't care that it's the internet. It's my account, it's my channels, it's my conversation, and if you don't like that, get the fuck out. If you don't know how to communicate with people that isn't fucking bad faith, you should have never been invited to the conversation, or if you were, get the fuck out to save yourself because you're gonna fucking shoot yourself in the foot. I hate having to say that to people. I have to pretend that they have any intelligence when they don't. They have no fucking moral bone in their fucking body. They have no intelligent bone in their fucking body. All of them that are bad faith, not all people, but all of them that are bad faith, are literally just husks of their former selves. That's all they are at the end of the day. Nothing more, nothing less. And I have to say it and tell it like it is. Because it is what it is, and I'm not going to tell you any different. Alright? I'm sick and tired of people's ignorance. I'm sick and tired of people's retardation. I'm sick and tired of the internet just relentlessly being the internet and saying, fuck your facts, fuck your feelings, fuck you people, fuck off the internet if you don't agree with us. Or fuck you for what you do on your channels and shit, even though it's the internet, even though it's my channel, my right, and my rules for conversations like this, about topics like this, and then some. But until then, I am Brian Mullins the Fox, signing out. Hi everybody, I am Brian Mullins the Fox, your delightful host. Back to you all with another statistical analysis video. What happened to the 13,383 children that were spared after being withdrawn from school legally by their own parents? I am obviously not asking how many because that's as obvious as it should be to all of you. I just want to know how many of them that were withdrawn from school came back to school despite their bodily conditions, especially 
extremely severe levels of PTSD, borderline impossible to have them in public at all without traumatizing others surrounding them, or without them dying? The answer to that question is, most likely, none of them. Because even though they were spared in 2017, they all eventually died of infection minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, or even years later after the fact. This would have been some big research project, but I have common sense and even consider that they all likely died anyway. The big difference is 13,383 is the same number of children that were spared as it is also a death toll in its own right. Not at all, adding to the roast game death toll regardless. Stay tuned for one of 2024's upcoming major events on my main channel called Among the 13,383 Children, because all the other info that I have then established for that topic alone is scheduled for the time that the event is scheduled. And in that major event of a miniseries, I will be talking about what literally happened to them, like demographics, age, race, gender, religion, and family structure, the aftermath, the trauma, and a few other things along the way. Let's talk about the legality of not just parents having the right to legally withdraw their children during both eras in America for any reason. Despite some laws making public school attendance mandatory parents still have the legal right to withdraw them from any school for any reason, including social anxiety, or even culture shock, which is the same reason why the roast game happened at all, at any time, and never send them back to either another school, or even worse for the 18,568,322 children during the roast game era, and the 13,383 children that were spared in 2017 after the roast game era ended, not homeschool them at all, moving them out or not moving out in the process anyway. So let's do a recap before I summarize by giving some commentary and finally go off on a rant as usual. Number one, it's far more than likely that all these 13,383 children died in the aftermath while not adding to the roast game death toll anyway. Number two, this goes for any of the schools in all the counties, states, and the entire country. They either erased the records of the 13,383 children that were spared in 2017, let alone the 18,568,322 children that died during the roast game era long after they were withdrawn in that era alone. Or the parents had the legal rights to do that themselves, facing no charges of any conspiracy or repercussions whatsoever, let alone any other charges to do with the murder of each and every one of the 18,568,322 children in America. I'll cover Canada next year in the next edition of the Roast Game Awareness Month. And the 13,383 attempted murders that end up failing monumentally, sparing them, but death inevitably came anyway. And finally, number three, there really wasn't going to be a massive research video anyway. Anyways, anyways, here's the short rant. Let me get this straight. How and why can children not be withdrawn for any reason by either one of the parents who have sole custody over them? That question is so simple to answer, but people don't care all that much about answering it. Here's the answer. Unless, if anyone like you can prove objectively that we live in a kind of dictatorship, mandating that everyone, let alone children, goes to a public school without being able to withdraw them for any reason, shut the fuck up. You cannot come up with a legal enough opportunity as a parent to ostracize these children from the society that they were supposed to get used to growing up. The next commentary slash rant edition of the Roast Game Awareness Month will be brief and to the point, talking about many other various minor things. After that, weekend number four will be about covering the two official roast game debates that took place a few years before debate.org even shut down, and the other two. After that will be about other things like my opinion on the two debates, how it can even it out a little bit more when it comes to the conversation back then. But I can't control time. Time can only go forwards, not backwards. And a bunch of other things after that that I like to talk about relating to the topic of the Roast Game in general in weekend number 5, the final weekend of the first edition of the Roast Game Awareness Month. Until then, I am Brian Mullins the Fox, signing out. See you then!
Hi everyone, I am Brian Mullins the Fox, your delightful host, giving you a few updates. This video will be different for this one reason alone. There are so many things I want to address before I get ready for weekend number four. More specifically, three things I want to address right off the bat before I preemptively end this video. Number one, I am going to cover a lot more than just what I promised for the second edition of the Roast Game Awareness Month, but I'll only get to them when that time comes in 2024, October 1st through 31st of that year, specifically. Number two, I am going to cover the two debates and my opinions on both of them in weekend number four. And finally, number three, and finally for weekend number five, I'll just be recapping what I've covered this month, weekend by weekend, Friday through Tuesday, covering all the five weekends and giving this first edition of the Roast Game Awareness Month its well-deserved conclusion. But until then, I am Brian and Mullins the Fox signing out. See you then. Hello everybody, I am Brian Mullins the Fox, your delightful host, and welcome to the 6th anniversary of the Roast Game as the topic of conversation and the 6th anniversary of the first Roast Game debate, which was originally titled Brian Mullins the Roast Game. Families were eating their own children for 19 years. I was the pro under the pseudonym Brian Mullins No Christmas 2, winning by 7 points, and my opponent was Yanagirl136, who lost the debate by having 0 points in this debate. And again, like that video discussing my side of the roast game debate.org shitstorm saga, I explained the lead up to this one debate. But now, let's just get to the debate. The roast game is pretty simple. First, ask any family member what is special about a holiday roast. The family member Member would have the tendency to guess assumptively ham, turkey, beef. You say no to the family member. Then you ask them who or what do you think is special. The family member says, I believe that children are special. You respond, so you eat children for a Christmas roast. The family member would freak out at you because he knew or she knew that the family ate children, specifically their butt meat, and he or she is surprised that you knew it too. The whole point of the game is to get your point across which is the idea that the family eats children, more specifically their butt meat, as their Christmas roast alternative, and you interview and prove your common knowing and realizing of the idea or tradition that families have or had. If they freak out, they already admitted it by proxy. I unironically linked one of the oldest music-related videos surrounding the topic of the roast game, which the original title is Winter Olympics by Alan Braden from 1960. The opponent responds with, I literally have no clue what this is supposed to be about. Nothing that the person who is pro slash for this posted makes any sense to me, nor the person who attempted to explain it to me. That's that. Whoops. Here's my final round. It does make sense, but you don't understand it. It's a psychological well tester, testing their will to tell the truth. Like asking them, what is special about a holiday roast? And them guessing as a response, ham, chicken, turkey, or beef. You tell them no, because they don't realize the point you're trying to get across their heads because they think they can get away with eating children more specifically their butt meat but suddenly you ask them another question like who or what do you think is special other than a holiday roast then they answer with this response children and believing that children are special which you respond to that with so you guys eat children as your christmas roast which gets them to freak out the whole topic is about getting your whole point across and at the same time proving the truth that that they omit by proxy. The truth in which I did with that long comment I made in the comment section below. I made my point clear, so vote for pro. And she rage quits with her last round. You know what? This was a pointless, confusing, stupid debate, and I don't honestly care if I lose. There, I said it. I won by seven points because the first would-be opponent that I challenged this debate to voted for me and the reason for voting decision was basically a forfeit i mean she said she doesn't care if she loses and she lost thank you so much for watching tune in for tomorrow's edition where i fully cover the second and the last major roast game debate the next one will be much longer than this i'm brian mullins the fox signing out see you then
Hi everybody, I am Brian Mullins the Fox, your delightful host, ready to cover the second and last official roast game debate that took place from November 29th, 2017 and around December 7th or 8th, 2017. Between me, who's the pro, Brian Mullins No Christmas 2 at the time, and the con, Wilson704, who initially started this debate to begin with, while I accepted the challenge. Without further ado, let's begin. Wilson704 starts it up with, I would like to hear your point of view first, please. Then I obliged him with this round, which is round one. First example, the roast game. The roast game is pretty simple. First, ask any family member what is special about a holiday roast. The family member would have the tendency to guess assumptively, ham, turkey, beef. You say no to the family member, then you ask them, who or what do you think is special? The family member says, I believe that children are special. You respond, you respond, so you eat children for a Christmas roast. More specifically, their butt meat. The family member would freak out at you because he knew or she knew if it's a female that the family ate children and he or she is surprised that you knew it too. The whole point of the game is to get your point across, which is the idea that the family eats children and more specifically their butt meat as their Christmas roast during this era, which is the roast game era 1998 to 2016, and you interview and prove your common knowing and realizing of the idea or tradition that families have. If they freak out, they already admitted it by proxy. It makes logical sense because when you ask a family member these questions, you get the sense that the family member is assuming that I don't know what they were eating, making excuses like guessing average roast meats like ham, turkey, your chicken, or specifically them lying about what they ate as the centerpiece of Christmas dinner during that era, then he or she faces your sudden answer, no, which gives them a sign that he or she is just making excuses to escape the question and to carry on with life. The roast game is just a psychological mind tester. It tests the human will to tell the truth, making it, as a result, a psychological will tester. Aside, it is easily provable by the fact that the roast game itself is easy proof that families were eating their own children more specifically for their butt meat after slaughtering them. After slaughtering them, they did this process where they skinned the children, take out any fecal matter or anything inedible to humans like the brain, the liver, or any irrelevant body part, slice the right meat parts off like the roast meat, debacterialize the meat, season it, then cook it. After cooking it, they eat the children. That's my proof, which is the logical explanation of the truth that is found out in the roast game, which to be honest is absolutely mind-blowing. I just gave my now to be non-existent wikia as a source, and it was also the same website that I introduced the original concept that came before the debate, and then I've linked the first debate right below that. Wilson said 704 follows that up with round two. I don't really understand by what you're stating, but I'll try to and respect it. Yes, I am new to this system and I am just trying to get my name out there. Here are my reasons why I think Christmas is a good thing. Number one, Christmas is a time where you can relax with your family. Number two, you get time off from school and work. Number three, you have a chance to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. And number four, presents. Christmas is a good time where you can be with family or close friends. Christmas is a time of peace, happiness, and joy. And this time when I'm reading these debate rounds, I'm not mocking the opponent like I used to. I follow up with my second round entry with Christmas should end because 18,568,300 22 children were slaughtered for their butt meat for not believing in Christmas. It's not about presents, family, and anything else you suggested. Second, giving is a bad thing because what if the boy or girl doesn't want it, need it, earn it, or deserve it? If they just want something without making a compromise that kids don't want to work hard for their quote-unquote presents, then they don't deserve any presents. All that they ever deserve is honesty. Also, Christmas is a lie because it's not about presents or anything you suggested. It's about lying. It is the holiday of lies. The second video are examples of photos of children that were slaughtered for not believing in Christmas or what it would look like hypothetically using generic stock gory images that was later removed years later by YouTube without giving my pre-furry channel a strike at all. 
Here are the sources, as noted here. Also, why would you believe all these lies your parents told you, like about Santa and about other things people lie about? Also, like Jesus and all that shit about the birth. Wilson 704 starts off round three with, just because someone is slaughtered, because someone with other beliefs killed them, doesn't mean that the holiday should end. Many people died for America's freedom, so Independence Day came into play. Um, number one, that's not what Independence Day was for. It was about independence from the British, which at the time, the founding fathers were still slave owners. Kind of ironic to put the deaths of others and use them as an argument to justify death. Look at ISIS, for example. They kill tens of thousands of people just because they don't agree with their beliefs. With all other things aside, Christmas is not about money, family, presents, or time off. Although all of those things are good. They're not the reason for Christmas. Christmas is about the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Why do you think there's Christ in Christmas? It wasn't Christmas before. It was Saturnalia. But then the Romans forced Christian beliefs on other people at around 336 AD, and then it became Christmas. I ended the third round with my entry. Jesus Christ is fake. He never existed. Though you believe in him, nothing is good about it. Not the giving, not the lies, not anything. Why have faith in someone who doesn't exist? You have to face the reality that Jesus Christ doesn't exist. More importantly, to go off script, why have faith in someone who doesn't exist and not have faith in those who did exist but died for not believing in things that don't exist. That makes no fucking sense. Anyway, now let's get back to it. Also, just like we need to eradicate ISIS, we need to eradicate Christmas. Though Christians have killed far more than ISIS has in their entire history. Independence Day has nothing to do with Christmas. If it did, they don't deserve to die. They deserve to survive. If you believe that these soldiers deserve to die, you are ungrateful for this country because what if they want to survive? They deserve to survive. Independence Day should not relate to death. The only holiday that should relate to death, unironically, is Christmas. And Christmas should end. There's no good reason to have Christmas, so that's why it should end. I believe that the death of a child is never justified, and it never will be. I believe that children should deserve a life worth living and not having to be slaughtered for not believing in Christmas. Sources to prove that Jesus Christ never existed listed below. I love that this was during a time where moderators never deleted sources they didn't like from opponent's argument rounds. Wilson 704's last entry was in round four, which is the last round of the debate. He goes, number one, I love this country with all my heart, and number two, do you realize that by ending Christmas, that means ending the holiday that most people love? 46% of people in the U.S. say Christmas is their favorite holiday. Number one, that's not a majority. In fact, that's kind of a minority, and it's getting lower as time went on, and as time goes on. I just can't wrap my head around the fact that you want to end Christmas just because you don't think that Jesus was real. Spoiler alert, he was. And then, I'm not going to waste my time, I'm just going to show the screenshots of my fourth and last round, which is long as fuck and repetitive as fuck. I conclude this debate by recapping what I argued, gave the sources, and then said, This has been a good debate we had, especially for me as pro, and I had so much fun debating with you, and I hope you have the best of luck in future debates. The choice is clear, vote for pro. I won by 5 points, with Wilson704 having 0 points by the end of this debate, when the voting period ended, and declared me the winner, which triggered a fuck ton of trolls anyway, especially the perpetually coping Dark Prince. With Super Duds becoming a troll after this vote, and he gave this reason for voting decision. I do think your evidence is somewhat biased in this, however, since it fully supports your claims you make and is not proven well enough by the con, and con uses a biased or opinionated view, that is where sources go. Arguments go pro here as well. Con could have countered that sources were biased and had no real intention, which of course I had real intention, you fucking moron, which could outweigh his arguments he was relying on, which is the same reason reason why Wikia was such a fucking bullshit SJW website, they hate facts that actually matter. They'll delete any Wikia that actually matters on their websites because they're snowflakes. Since he uses a source that people were slaughtered when they didn't believe in Xmas and the con never really counters, I have a right as a judge to vote on the argument. Your examples you used in round three are completely irrelevant and complete fallacy for the claim you're making. ISIS kills people for not 
being Muslim, not celebrating Ramadan. Argument goes con. Hey, dipshit, you didn't vote for the con at all. You voted for me. If you really were voting for the con, I would have lost this one. But incompetency wins, and so did I. Even though I'm not incompetent at all, which is ironic in its own right. So that concludes me reading the second and last official former roast game debate in the next two commentary rant videos for Sunday and Monday. For weekend number four will just be my opinions on these two debates and my suggestions for how these two debates should have really gone down. But until then, I am Brian Mullins the Fox signing out. See you then. Hello everybody, I am Brian Mullins the Fox, your delightful host. I'm back to recording after that tooth extraction, as of recording this. I am still recovering, but I'm not too hurt to speak out loud and record. The rant won't be me screaming for obvious reasons. So without further ado, let's begin. Well, the first debate should have been far more productive if Yana Girl 136 actually learned to entertain a fucking hypothetical a day in her pathetic life. If anything, that's the biggest reason why the trolls got so fucking heated throughout the entire RoastGameDebate.org shitstorm saga. It's because all of them are so low IQ that they not only can't even handle the concept of entertaining a hypothetical, they had to de-platform me in the end because they're not just so stupid, but also arrogant and smug whilst being stupid. Imagine how stupid people are today when they can't even engage in and entertain hypotheticals, regardless if they make sense or not, in comparison to how stupid these people were in 2017. But also imagine going back in time and just picture how so many things would have played out so differently. I would have been able to start doing research as early as January 2018 instead of late September 2018. Things would have gone down so much more smoothly, and I feel like shit that it didn't. That's just me and my honest opinion. What was the Will Tester hypothetical has not just become a reality, but perfectly reflects on the past statistically before my first research video ever, which was technically the one about calories, validating the use of the Roast Games original concept even as of then. Also, vindicating all my research in the process with this video verifying its original concept statistically long after Wiki it had to be an SJW website and removed that one. I'm not counting the satirical shit posts on that wiki about other irrelevant shit. I'm glad that all this shit went down anyway, no matter how awful it was for me. Because I found out a way to emotionally and mentally recover. Then, I had the perfect ability to move on later. I covered all the roast game dramas later on throughout the years anyway, not to reignite all the now-to-be-dead dramas, but to keep them in the living memory. And now, here's the unscripted rant. By the way, the next video will be completely and totally off-script as well. I can't even believe I got the ability to record rants like this again after my tooth extraction, but here we go. My opinion on this first roast game debate that took place on October 20th, 2017, it was complete and utter craziness complete inability to engage in hypotheticals. People nowadays are so fucking stupid, a lot of them can't even engage in hypotheticals without engaging in bad faith, because that's exactly what they are when they refuse to engage in hypotheticals, let alone entertain them. And I have a good suspicious feeling that this first edition of the Roast Game Awareness Month will end in a bang. All of these bad faith individuals really give me a hell of a lot of trust issues on the internet. Especially when it comes to the fake diaspora of fake drama in 2023. When everything, even when it's 100% factual, is just your opinion, and your opinions are automatically wrong. So fuck you. You know, if anybody said that unironically, I'd block you. I'd honestly block you because you're too fucking stupid to engage in anything in good faith. So there is no way that I can actually have a conversation that's worth any value at the end of the day. And with that being said, the summary of my opinion, this debate would have gone off so much better and it would have been so much more of positive engagement and intelligent engagement. But that wasn't the case because people are so stupid even as of now, entertaining a hypothetical regardless if it makes sense or not is a literal thought crime. I am Brian Mullins the Fox signing out. See you in the next video. Bye.
Hello everybody, I am Brian Mullins the Fox. This one won't be as long as the last one. I'm just here to give my opinion on the second roast game debate which started and took place on November 29th, 2017. At least Wilson704 was good faith enough to keep the conversation going within the debate. After the debate ended, he decided to become one of the 16 plus debate.org trolls that decided to rally up against me for months, and I haven't even seen him since December of 2017. There were just other trolls who were fucking me over at every given opportunity and chance they got, which ended up casting a permanent scar on Debate.org and its reputation, so much to the point where it shut down on June 6th, 2022. And the internet is a much better place for it without that website, but it's a much worse place for general online debate or discussion on anything else original. You'll just be left out of many, many gatekeeping communities, especially the atheist ones. Many atheists are just as ironically faithful to science as religious people are faithful to their own gods. That's really sad. And I've seen many atheists fall to this very irony. But the second debate was great. Even though the perpetually coping dark prince was nothing more than an arrogant tinfoil hat wearing rambling lunatic. Anything else was just a bunch of fucking back and forth comments, a voting bomb attempt failed, and a bunch of bullshit drama throughout January and February, months after the debate ended. Well, I know this one was going to be brief, but, you know, here's this brief rant before I go. These two really should have gone down much more smoothly, just like I said in the last video about the first, but fuck what happened to me on Debate.org, fuck Debate.org. That website, even when it's gone, can still eat shit and die in a fire. I'm Brian Mullins the Fox, signing out. See you then. Hello everybody, I am Brian Mullins the Fox, your delightful host, here with the beginning of the end of the first edition of the Roast Game Awareness Month. Let's recap weekend number one. Let's start with the first video going over the post-Easter Roast Game era 2019 to present. Number one, overall, no matter how it goes, the consumption and waste stats of all these four centerpiece meats, ham, lamb, turkey, and beef, decline and or slightly increase from year to year. Number two, even with Alec Pau's complete fuck up at statistical data theft, he doesn't back up the $104 number figure in any part of the said article I cited in that first installment of weekend number one. Even if he did, the total price is contradictory to the figure itself anyway. Number three, we went over a survey and statistical figure according to the National Retail Federation and a bunch of others along the way. Number four, never take surveys either with 100% as fact, nor should you take it with too big a grain of salt. And finally, let's continue with the second video. I went through with explaining my side of the massive cancer of a fiasco known as the Roast Game Debate.org Shitstorm Saga. And that does it for recapping Weekend 1 of the first edition of the Roast Game Awareness Month. I am Brian Mullins the Fox, signing out. Tune in the next episode where I recap Weekend number 2. See you then. Hi everybody, I am Brian Mullins the Fox, your delightful host, here to recap all we've learned from weekend number two of the first edition of the Roast Game Awareness Month. Let's start with the first video of the second weekend of this edition's recap with me having entertained the post-traditional Christmas dinner era theory, which is the third installment. Number one, I still don't know which year it will be until I see a recurring trend that makes itself clear and apparent that it's either 2026 or 2027. Number two, 
during the roast game era, even when teachers surrounding children are mandatory reporters in America, just like first responders, and even the principal of that school himself or herself if it's a woman. The reason why they'd never notice or care is because one of their parents legally took them out of school by withdrawing them out of school legally for any reason, even in the state of California, where it's mandatory to attend public schools. Because they think some of their own children are a threat to society, much less their extreme Christian beliefs. And number three, I believe that Thanksgiving, much less Thanksgiving dinner, will suffer in the end. Next, let's get into the fourth installment where I found out how many children slash children by law that were withdrawn because of the roast game or because they refused to believe in or questioned the ideals of Christmas during the roast game era, 1998 to 2016. Here are the statistics. The average number of kindergartners withdrawn for every single normal 365 day year, 99,165 of them. The average number of elementary school students withdrawn during a 365 day year, 556,396 of them. The average number of middle school students withdrawn during a 365 day period during the roast game era, 49,790 of them. And finally, the average number of high schoolers withdrawn, only up to 14 to 17 years old during a 365 day period, which is a normal year during the roast game era, 271,929 of them. All of this obviously adding up to 977,280 per 365 day year during the roast game era. And let's account for all leap years, which which are 366 day years. Kindergarten, 272 daily, just like with the normal 365 day year period. 99,436 of them yearly instead of 99,165. Elementary school, 1,524 daily, which is the same for a 365 day period, and the slight difference of 557,923 yearly. Middle school, 136 daily, instead of it being 49,790 of them, like there were for a normal 365 day period, it's 49,926 of them yearly for these 366 day leap years during the roast game era. And finally, let's get to high school. 745 daily, just like for the normal 365 day years during the roast game era, but the minor difference, of course, accounting for leap years, instead of it being 271,929 of them, it's 272,672 of them yearly. For each 366 day leap year during the roast game era, which again were 2000, 2004, 2008, 2012, and 2016. All of these withdrawal numbers add up to 979,957 per leap year during the roast game era, as it very well should. And here are the other stats when it comes to the demographics of children, be it white, black slash African American, Hispanic, Asian, and slash or any other race. Now let's get to recapping the fifth installment. Now for the fifth installment, it boils down to three things. Number one, there's a lack of kindergarten, elementary, and middle school dropout statistics, not because they just don't really drop out at all or not very much, but because statisticians, just like parents, don't care to account for them at all in America. Number two, it is not statistical data theft because there simply is isn't data for America, but for any other country. And number three, parents don't really care enough about their children's education. 
And now, let's get to finishing this recap video by recapping the sixth and last installment for weekend number two. For this one, just to be blunt, is simply that the roast game was never a writer's barely disguised fetish, and those that say that to either do it for the lols as a joke or because they actually believe that retarded failed abortion of a conspiracy theory are part of the problem, and they use a fake fictional fanfic story about Sasha being raped against her will even though dogs really don't have a will nor do they have a way to consent just like humans do which is not zoophilic in any way shape or form and to add a simple cherry on top people dogs eating human meat simply isn't cannibalism cut print and end the fuck of Thank you so much for watching this massive recap. I'm Brian Mullins the Fox signing out. Tune in next time and the next episode where we recap weekend number three. See you then. Hi everybody. I am Brian Mullins the Fox, your delightful host, here to recap weekend number three with two more to go before this first edition comes to its well-deserved end and leaving the next edition to take its toll next October. The first one of this weekend, which is the seventh installment, is basically proving that people just don't do their research on anything anymore, let alone Christmas dinner stats and history, and the six reasons why I'm not amongst their number. And here they are. Why is this the case, you may ask, to refresh your memory? Because people are lazy, stuck up, arrogant, useless, worthless, do nothing losers. All those characteristics don't at all perfectly sum me up because of the following reasons. Number one, I am not lazy in my research. I put so much hard work in any video that I do such painstaking research on. Number two, I am not stuck up. I just take actual criticism, not bullshit, non-criticisms, or troll comments that are useless with their terrible, no good, very bad, quote unquote, counsel, or quote unquote, advice. I am usually kind and honest with my audience, and tell all these trolls and losers to piss off. Number three, I'm not a useless researcher because research sometimes is hard even for me to do because of how useless other people who don't do their goddamn research are at all. Number four, I am not a worthless content creator. It's just that YouTube has the borderline fetish of repressing smaller content creators who even try to excel on the platform. Number five, I am not a do-nothing person. I am not too lazy a furry to be too passionate a researcher on the internet. So that's out of the way. I just phrased number four differently, so you still remember the original. And finally, number six, and finally, I'm not a loser. I don't have to explain that to you, because fuck anyone who thinks that I should. Now let's recap the eighth installment. It's just simply talking about what people don't understand about statistics, let alone Christmas dinner statistics, and how all of that makes sense. Then, let's get to recapping the ninth installment. This installment is about what happened to the 13,383 children that were spared after being withdrawn from school legally by one of their parents. And here's what we've learned in that video. Number one, it's far more likely that all these 13,383 children died in the aftermath while not adding to the roast game death toll anyway. Number two, this goes for any of the schools in all the counties, states, and the entire country as a whole. They either erased the records of the 13,383 children, let alone the 18,568,322 children that died during the roast game era before they were withdrawn, or the parents had the legal rights to do that themselves, facing no charges of any conspiracy whatsoever, let alone any other charges to do with the murder of each and every one of the 18,568,300 22 children. I'll cover Canada next year. And the 13,383 attempted murders that end up failing monumentally. And number three, there really wasn't going to be a massive research video anyway.
And finally, let's recap the 10th and last installment of and for weekend number three, which were simply the minor but important things to update my audience on before weekend number four or quote-unquote the big weekend. And that does it for this entire edition of recapping all the weekends. Tune in next time and next episode where I recap weekends number four. I am Brian Mullins the Fox, signing out. See you then. Hi everybody, I am Brian Mullins the Fox, your delightful host, here to recap the final set of all the weekends where I actually went over some interesting shit. For installment 11 and 12, I read the first and second roast game debates that were on a website known as debate.org, a website that to this day does not exist. Went over both of them little by little without repeating myself too much like I did in the 2018 recording of the roast games one year anniversary. Next, let's recap the 13th installment of the first edition of the Roast Game Awareness Month. I gave my opinion on the first and now to be six year old roast game debate. And here's what I've highlighted in that video. Number one, things would have gone down so much more smoothly and I feel like shit that it didn't. That's just me and my honest opinion. And number two, I'm glad that all this shit went down anyway, no matter how awful it was for me. Because I found out a way to emotionally and mentally recover. Then, I've had the perfect ability to move on later. I covered all the roast game dramas later on throughout the years anyway. Not to reignite all the now-to-be-dead dramas, but to keep them in living memory. Last but not least, let's recap the final installment of weekend number four, or in Installment number 14. I just gave my opinion on the second roast game debate, and that's about it. Thank you all so much for watching. We're almost done with the entire month of October. Tune in for the next and last episode of the first edition of the Roast Game Awareness Month, where I don't just recap the recapping weekend itself, but go into a few more interesting things before I go, then go off on a passionate rant, then introduce you to a montage to pay tribute to the entire month, and then my final sign-off for the month of October. See you then! Hello everybody, I am Brian Mullins the Fox, your delightful host. For this one video only, the fox you see as the main avatar is not my persona. Here with a whole laundry list of things to do before October is done, and the first edition of the Roast Game Awareness Month is over. Let's first start out with recapping weekend number 5 as a whole. I've done a lot this weekend. I have simply recapped the following. Number 1, weekend number 1. The post-Easter Roast Game Era and explaining my side of the Roast Game Debate.org Shitstorm Saga. Number 2, weekend number 2. The post-traditional Christmas dinner era theory, roast game era, school withdrawal statistics in America, lack of kindergarten, elementary and middle school dropout statistics, and finally, the roast game was never a writer's barely disguised fetish. Number three, weekend number three, how people just don't do their research anymore, even when it comes to Christmas dinner statistics, what people don't understand about statistics and how all of that makes sense, what happened to the 13,380 83 children, when it came to school withdrawals and death, and finally other miscellaneous things to update my audience on before the big weekend in quotations. Number 4, weekend number 4, reading the first roast game debate, reading the second roast game debate, giving my opinion on the first debate, and finally giving my opinion on the second debate. Number 5, and finally, weekend number 5. Recapping all we've learned, went over, and here we are now. Now here are a few more things before my passionate rant. 
Here are a few more things I have not yet mentioned before the end of October that I should mention here and now. Number one, the school withdrawal statistics add to the laundry list of explanations I made in the roast game Topical Autopsy. It acts as an additional piece of context I've added to the process before they're exposed to the chloroform part. Number two, overall, the roast game couldn't have been the one and only thing to happen as a death sentence to traditional Christmas dinner and traditional Christmas dinner history in both countries. It's also personal and even familial dinner preferences and the ye old fashioned traditionally modeled one could get in the way of that. So in that way, it could also be the case of families being forced to not be traditional, which would expedite traditional Christmas dinners death in both America and Canada only. The same goes for the post roast game era as it did for the roast game era in general. Number three, accounting for basically everything, not just inflation, prices, probabilities, or even the history behind Christmas dinner itself, the roast game would even have just as much, or if not more, and the same goes for the cultural impact that it needs to have shifted the minds of both bodies of national population, Americans and Canadians combined, one traditional Christmas dinner dies in either the end of 2026 or the end of 2027. And finally, number four. Not only has the debate ended a long ass time ago, the conversation surrounding Surrounding the topic is really beginning to fade away. And here's my last prediction of the month. The conversation's life depends on the life of traditional Christmas dinner. And since it's dependent that way, one traditional Christmas dinner in both America and Canada does die, the conversation dies too. So now, allow me to go off on the final passionate rant before the montage and the sign off. This rant will not be me going off for far too long because the message of it is far too damn simple for that shit. Let's get to it. A time for the short, passionate rant of the ages. A stunning revelation I have for all of you watching this right now exactly when it's premiering. I have just one thing to say. You are the problem. I am part of the problem just as much, if not more, than any of you can ever imagine. Just because I can't convince every single slack-jawed idiot in the back row as much as you can just does not mean and never will mean that I'm terrible at making a case for myself and it's just that I should stop. No, that's not the case at all. That will never be the case at all. If you are unironically watching this video, thinking that that is the case, pause it and think about what you've done in society. You have just contributed to the trivialization of what everyone has kept trim and true for the past 97 years before the roast game era. Then you have contributed to anything really good since it ended in 2016. And you not only should feel ashamed of the people who thought it was a good idea to abandon those traditions back then as you are of yourself. You all should be ashamed of yourself to have ever come back to it after it ended and not intervened in any way shape or goddamn form you all are just sad and strange people trying to find what's right in the world and just stuck and lost in finding what's really wrong with it all what the fuck people what the fuck and that's that, people. That's the passionate rant. That's the message. And you should, as this video ends, stop with this self-pity for Christ's sake, you baby. Just stop and think about what you've done.
am Brian Mullins the Fox, signing off for the month of October. See you all in the next edition of the Roast Game Awareness Month. And for everyone else watching, have a happy Halloween and goodbye.